This is Cohesion, Concepts and Context, where we unpack and explore everything from architecture to the human experience around design. I'm Malk al and in today's episode, Atmospheres, where we discuss the nuances of space, the subconscious, and developing unique environments. I have John Buffini here with me today. And Hello. Let's get into it. The thing for me about atmospheres and environments, we were up in... Uh, a mountain range, uh, working on one of your projects. And we were spending the night in a kind of cabin slash motel that must have been built like a hundred years ago. And you were getting more and more excited. It was around 11 o'clock at nighttime. And we were talking about monasteries and monastic environments. And we were talking about how they can speak to people and the sense of silence. And we were getting more excited. And then we heard this pounding on the the adjacent wall going keep it down and i could not stop laughing because we were literally talking about environments and the the intentionality of environments and we were in a place that wasn't intentional about their environments and instead it was full of noise pollution and we were the noise pollution (laughs) no i I remember that vividly because it was just it it just made me giggle because that was off you know, a random thought that you just brought up, but I think that's something that's been... You've been creating important. environments for as long as I've known. What is it about developing environments that uh, is so you're so drawn to? Well, I like to... Obviously, I project onto things, whether it's landscapes, environments, places, spaces, um, and I like to create things and develop ways that people can navigate through different environments and space allows me to do that and creating and building space um, allows me to orient people subconsciously through that environment in a way that I perceive it and I don't have to be present in that space once it's built and complete and people are experiencing it and uh, I think that that's a really fun uh, play-by-play that I play in my head as I'm Mm. developing and building out space and Mm. curating vignettes and viewpoints and orientations and Mm. all of those different elements. Well, as we're recording this, we're in the high desert on, uh, I don't know, it's about two or 300 acre uh, site that you're working on. And it's really hard to explain the noise of silence in a place that overlooks i just looked it up over a million acres so this property overlooks a million acres of nothing but quiet and my ears were ringing from the silence and it was reflecting off of the concrete structures and then there was a little ripple in the pool and then there was a, a bit of a breeze coming off the valley and as a bag of DNA that normally is in downtown San Diego, uh, I could not grasp the environment that I was in. Do you want to explain a little bit about what I just experienced? Like you created this, I experienced it, and you were not surprised by it. So can you expound on that? Uh, Yeah. So the property that Johnny's talking about right now is Folly Mojave. So you can check it out, follymojave.com, and get a good snippet of what he's painting a picture of and in audio form uh the whole part and you know you kind of get inspired or i do get inspired by the environment itself and there's a lot of elements at play here specifically on this on this project site and it you know we talk about this idea of the technical off-grid you know with the utilities aspect but also i think there's a mental aspect to it where you mentally disconnect from your day-to-day and this place does that for me and I believe it will do that for others. Um, and the way of creating this, this idea of a, creating a sanctuary that's integrated in nature and not imposed on it, you know, we're not imposing ourselves here uh, on this property. We really try to integrate all aspects of fuse function and be in harmony with the idea of that, this environment, but developing our own environment within it. Um, and so I think that's really important to integrate mindfulness and sustainability into design and that 
I believe can create subconscious moments in people's minds as they navigate through that space and experience different things that they might have not. Speaking of experiences, I think if our listeners actually want to experience one of your environments, if they do go to Folly Mojave, there's an opportunity for them to uh, stay in one of your designs on the property. So I think experiential knowledge is so layered and full of shadows and full of context that I think actually experiencing yourself is a great thing. You have done a diverse set of environments from LA living to mountains, to high desert, to expansive Hamptons overlooking, you know, hundreds of acres of, I don't know what they call it as a marshland or where all the pheasants are, all the water. Yeah, like all the all the farm fields all over the Hampton Bays. One of the things that your um, designs, designing environments have in common is that they don't have anything in common in terms oh, yeah. of their actual lo- location. Yeah. So what would you say environmentally is one of the threads that threads your designs in each environment? Mother Nature, I think, is mm. the best way to... You know, those those elements were there before me, before all of us, and they'll continue to be there. Um, and they're consistent and they're part of that and unique to that specific environment. So responding to those um, elements first and orienting myself um, and getting to know that environment's really important first. Um, that's part of like a big part of the site analysis and you know, being in this space, understanding how things feel, how, and, you know, utilizing our just basic senses to see. I don't think there's anything basic about anybody's senses. I think it's the fundamental part of the sound of your own voice. If I get the opportunity to capture it, and I've seen it myself personally, of this faraway look that you have when you're standing on a pre-building site, and you're immersed inside of the design that isn't there yet. Right. Someday, it's kind of like a cat looking out at nighttime that kind of <laughs> freaks you out, is that that's what you do, is you have a way of looking across something, and that's where the master bedroom is, and that's where this is. And even today, I kind of put my hands up like blinkers uh, to see what you were looking at before these 10-inch walls were form- formed. Um and they were beautifully centered, the views. Mm-hmm. Um, what is about nature that is your co-creator? What is it about nature that is your partner in developing an environment? It's consistent. I think it's mm-hmm. just, there's just something really unique about, you know, this concept of showing up, you know, whether the sun goes up and comes down. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, you, you get magic hour at sunset. You have this amazing sunrises and you have... Uh, you know, the, even like the coyotes just doing their thing and all of the acoustics. That Engaging our cortisols, you mean, <laughs> yeah. at, the, at the middle of the night? Just, just like, <laughs> not even in the middle of the night, just right on sunset. sunset. It just yeah. taps right into it. And it's just like, it's so refreshing to to hear those things. Mm. And it, it it's doing, it's... Your hair's breath from nature. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And you, I'm, all I'm doing is kind of just put it, putting, creating this... Um, the space and this medium for people to experience nature on a platform and and not in, you know interrogating it but integrating into it mm. and really kind of experiencing it front and center i think for listeners what i would love them to focus on is what is the sound of your own voice yeah how are you intentionally incorporating that into what you want to be creative about, what you want to be intentional about, and then what do you want to um, have that as a legacy piece where, in a sense, it's part of your uniqueness, it's part of your brand. And how do you build on it, too? Yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of my big things is how am I building on to my work and where is it next and how am I kind of diversifying my skill set and I'm figuring it out every day as we navigate all of these different moving parts so it's not just one particular project uh, but it's a vocabulary um, and it's always different it's always unique because it is challenging to be able to play all of these different roles um, <clears throat> but I think there is a stitching of like design principles that get carried out through all of the various environments and I think that goes back to my thesis work and where my position on architecture has And also part of your voice is having an eye. So we were actually introduced by a a 
really gifted uh, photographer. And in the back of my head, when I had met you, I was really struck by your creative vision, but I was also struck by how insolent and stubborn you were about your vision because you were an architecture student renting an apartment and you're like, no, the lighting is wrong. No, <laughs> it, it, it can't face this way. No, it can't be this. And I'm like, who does he think he is? He's a poor college student. And you kept that sense of lighting and sense of awareness and environmental sensitivity all the way through the last decade and a half. Yeah. And, uh, and now it's, you know, it's being supported in terms of uh, your artwork. But I just encourage people like whatever people notice about you, you should reflect on because it's probably something you're good at. Right. So even when you're an impoverished college student, you were uh, discerning and filtering the sound of your own voice about where am I going to study? Where am I going to work on my thesis? Uh, and you weren't paying attention. Could I afford something or not afford something? It was how am I letting the space speak to me? Yeah, no, I think, and I think that's a great point to, to give in, in the sense of advice to people um, and how to reflect, how to use others to reflect on yourself and figure out kind of hone in where your craft is, you know, because I know I still kind of dabble with that and figure out like what's the best or what's the next right move and how do you navigate certain things and where do I need to hone my craft in or um, I think that's all important and it's all part of the diversifying your skill set. If you were not to be humble for a second, which I find your humility to be uh, inconvenient when we're oh, trying to God. discuss things, um, but we actually had a famous actress come and stay on one of your properties, uh, actually just this week, uh, uh, one of many, but uh, they were experiencing this property raw, yeah. and two people had identified your passion and your genius, and you were um, not bothered by it, but you um, were trying to look at it from their perspective. If you allowed yourself to go, okay, I really do work on my environments. What is that one thing that tends to tip me over the edge where people in the creative arts who are around really notable things without breaking any NDAs, but really around notable things that are drawn to you, what do you think that thing is so the sound of your own voice stubbornly holding on to your vision but what's that one thing that you think if you were not to be humble for a second is i think it's follow through like mm. you follow through that original intent that mm. you had and you work through that idea and that idea might not be the best idea at the beginning but as you work through it you realize through that process and through the the back and forth you're actually building on to something or you're you wouldn't be to, you wouldn't get to the end point the end game or the end point unless you kind of work through it um and i think follow through is where people fall short um in regards to where they want to go and how, what goal they want to try and achieve especially when it comes to design design and building which is so tedious and so slow and you have to be very patient with the process and the people surrounding the process because the construction industry is not necessarily one that is um consistent consistent or has been advanced mm. really it's just a painstaking mm. process mm. um and it's you know it's like happening having a open heart surgery mm. and you're just in the midst of all of it and all you want to do is kind of get to the end game and stitch everything up and make sure that it's all buttoned up and it's curated and thought through but i think through that process it's really important to be able to go through with the follow through, be able to create bite-sized chunk decision making when it gets overwhelming and just continue on the original intent of what you said for yourself. Uh, from my uh, professional experience, I, I have experienced that fear, false evidence appearing real, tends to uh, block people or have people submit to being liked, to not uh, creating confrontation. And we watched a video, I'm uh, sorry, a documentary um, on Tom Ford yeah. and how he adhered to his vision, but he also focused on creating buy-in. I think you could probably remember the sentence he said. Uh, don't you think? Yeah, don't. Isn't this great? Don't you think? Or don't you think? Don't you think? And it was so facilitated, but respectful. But it was also like a ship breaking through ice. Yeah. Of 
getting the we and together behind a vision. Right. And talk to me a second about that, because sometimes your vision can be aloof or it can be elevated or it can be abstract. 21st century I abstract. Think, I think abstract or secret agent is the best way sometimes in describing words. Um, and how do you sentences. create buy-in from the abstract? I think through visual imagery mm. and through the work itself. So the development of the design itself and creating um, vignettes of what you're trying to convey through visual form. I think people respond to that mm -hmm. very well. That in correlation with actual tangible like plans and specifications and, you know, painting a picture, mm -hmm. essentially, and painting the picture by your own means and methods of what you have in your skill set mm -hmm. to be able to convey that to one person, a, a private dinner or an audience, I think is really important. Um, and I think that's how I uh, do that on my end and be able to explain. So I will, I'll be having a conversation with somebody, but I'll have it, uh, you know, I'll pull up photos on my phone or I'll mm -hmm. describe different environments just because it's a lot easier for people to um, understand the abstract, especially if the project is like not your traditional mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. It could be very like, wait, what are you doing? And mm -hmm. where is it? And how? And what does that mean? And mm -hmm. so understanding all of those different elements is really important. One of the tools. things that I, in my world I tell uh, business leaders is take the vision and backtrack to the present. And I think a great way to backtrack a uh, horizon abstract concept yeah. is by visuals or by simple word pictures. And so encouraging our listening audience to what are you trying to say in a way that creates buy-in engagement cooperation because you can't do all this environmental creation by yourself. Right. No, exactly. And I think that's why uh, seeking out the right help and uh, the right uh, people around you is really important to also believe in the vision and believe in the direction, whether it's a product, it's a, a space, it's a building, it's an, uh, a tangible thing, or even if it was a digital uh, piece of art, whatever it may be, I think it's important to surround yourself with the right people to be able to help you kind of get to that point. And it sounds cliche stating those kind of like obvious advice uh, points, but I think it, it, it is valid and it's important. Another environmental uh, commonality that you have is you intersperse crazy, insane moments of luxury or space inside of your environments. So uh, I think maybe 10 years ago, I went inside of just a water closet. It was a toilet and a sink. And it was in L.A. And so there wasn't a lot of square footage, you know, you were using the square footage uh, of the space. But I think the ceiling was 25 feet high with a skylight, a huge skylight. And I think I've seen many of a water closet with giant skylights on a lot of your properties. You tend to look for cracks of daylight to be super dramatic, dramatic. And bold drama <laughs> uh, inside of of sometimes traditional spaces, sometimes yeah. uh, you know a cabin in Idlewild, uh, a high desert hasn't been touched by humans it, it, since human existed, and you'll take uh, crazy bold moves that make it work. And there's a in psychology, the psychologists say that certain experiences exist above words. Mm -hmm. And some of your crazy environmental design, you know, design inclusions into your environment can be uh, transcend words. Where did you get your boldness to do some of these <gasps> moments? <laughs> um, I think I think it's more about doing the project or the space right and so if it feels right to first of all you're being humble which is irritating yeah. secondly <laughs> you need to restate it in terms of you know that people walk into certain spaces and mm -hmm. get the knees knock under them because you played with your food you played with your environment so right. really tell me what it is it's not a just yeah uh i think i think it just comes natural to me in the sense of like what feels right in this space, what should go there, how to curate that. There's no like magic abracadabra. I think it just comes to me in the sense of like, that should be here. This should be this way. Um, there's not really much thought to it besides 
just uh, responding to the environment that I'm in. Again, I think I'll unpack it one step more for the audience is there's a boldness to the design uh, strategies that you fold into environments. Right. And it's somehow connected to what normal people would connect to. How will other people judge me for this? Right. And you don't have that. You, yeah, because it's about setting the tone, and it's about what. There we go. It's, it's Let's not, talk about that. Setting the tone. It's not necessarily what other people may think of it. I think it's what what I believe is mm. the right thing to do for the space, and how to set the tone, and how to get the most out of the space, and whether it's square footage, whether it's views, whether it's environment, whether whether it's um, uh, creating an atmosphere, and and how to do that in a space, whether it's a steam room that happens to be in the upper by an attic and using the roof line from the lower level and the upper level and having that be the lean back bench back as you're steaming in a steam shower. Um, and 300 year old trees uh, just uh, swaying above, above your head. <laughs> so like whatever that, whatever that may be, or you're in the midst of a grazing field and you're watching donkeys stroll mm. by and what vignettes are mm. you looking out at and how are you getting privacy? But at the same time, you feel like you're in the middle of an organic farm. Um, all of those things. Uh, it's just a matter of setting the tone, whether it's in a design uh, approach, whether it's upon entry or upon arrival of someone walking into the space. All of those things, I think, play a role. Uh, and being as authentic as possible about that response is really important. I think if our listeners paused this podcast and backtracked the last two minutes and wrote down every filter that Malik said, I think that would help every one of our listeners amplify, add shadow and context to the sound of their own voice. And so just as an exhortation, uh, the thing for me is uh, I am uh, I am just a, a, a witness to your history. I'm just a witness to um, your narrative. Um, we, I know your history and I'm aware of your present. Can we highlight some future trends that you think um, in terms of sustainable design or uh, biomimicry or, you know, regenerative architecture? Or, you know, uh, is there is there specific things that that you can uh, focus on? In built environments. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's a lot of different things. And I think obviously sustainability takes center stage, uh, for all of us, but I think actual sustainability, that's why I think I've been pushing so hard on the off grid aspect and being self sufficient and self sustainable. Cause if each one of us does our part and unplug from all of these utilities and external grids, mm. we kind of are doing our part, but it's like, how do you do that? And how do you achieve that in a way that's cost effective, that makes sense, that is proactive. And I, I, do you think there's a lot to say about prefab homes and modular shelters and being able to have controlled environments to build high quality built residences to resolve the housing shortage and all of these different things, but do it in an architectural way, do it in a curated and thought through way, and then building homes that can grow with you is really important. And that's something that I've been really focused on and diving into with, uh, you know, the M shelter endeavor um, and exploring all of those different aspects from these small modular shelters all the way through to like full blown by that, you know, by that home assemblies that grow with you, with your family. Because I always think there is, there's always a miss with people buying a small house and then they do a renovation. They have to suffer through that process. And then maybe it's not dialed in properly and so it looks a little hodgepodge and it's not really thought through and the atmosphere mm. is kind of lost whatever mm. it might have been like a really charming old cottage is now just a butcher, a butcher yeah. Yeah. on trend mm. like painfully speaking you know mm. uh pinterest written <laughs> oh, i was reading this uh, uh, neuroscientist report about our neuroreceptors uh firing and not firing as we walk through the threshold of a doorway yeah and we can forget why we walked through yeah. that doorway yeah um and it's actually coming from our natural self yeah. going through i don't know what's connected to our ancient man walking into the entrance of a cave but if we, our neuroreceptors are responding to the frame of a door, how are they responding to a hodgepodge design? <laughs> yeah, because and it's, and it's, it's more also it's not like, oh, each space has to be that. I think it's just more like, how do you help 
resolve that mm -hmm. to the to to all or to mm -hmm. most um or to those who care elegant problem solving yeah, yeah and I, I think and it, i think there's ways to be able to do that and i think with this type of housing and sorting out this this approach to owning equity in your own home and not just renting um is really important conversations to be had especially if you're a young adult um and you're starting out and you're trying to figure out what your next right move is and i think all of those things are definitely a part of the future. Another line through from your history to your future, I actually got to experience at sunset today because I was uh, watching the sunset in your Mara design, which again, you can look at on Folly Mojave. Um, and I was just like, other than you paying for Wi-Fi or some bioethanol fuel, this space is completely powered and watered all by self-sustaining energy and beyond that from your thesis you know a millennia ago you wrote about taking a downtown opera house in la and interdigitating it with other things so that instead of ten thousand exper people experiencing it a hundred thousand people could experience it and here i am watching the sunset going he just spent 20 minutes talking about how this space can be a relaxation space. It can be a wedding space, how the pool can have a, a little uh, provocative bridge over it that's installed for weddings, um, uh, photo shoots. You just went through a whole palette of different opportunities in one space. Right. And it it whiplashed me back to your thesis as you would say freedom flexibility and options yeah you need to have those Absolutely. and i think that was it's kind of it's the idea of me painting this canvas and this atmosphere for others to be able to um put their creative experiences on whether it's writing a book you know on a day bed for the whole mm. day um mm. screenwriting a script uh, having a small retreat a mm. team building thing you know mm. um activity having a barbecue having a family reunion having a small intimate event or venue or wedding or whatever it may be i just like this idea of using yeah. the same environment both for multiple campuses exactly because i, I think it's uh it's just the right way to design there shouldn't be just like one rigid way um, to to look at a space, I think there should it should be flexible in certain ways, and mm. then uh, very uh, specific in others. Mm. Yeah. So I would say to put a synopsis in here: uh, people creating environments, hearing the sound of your own voice, being intentional about the extravagant or bold parts of your uniqueness, your brand, and then allowing freedom, flexibility, and options with the outcome of your environment that you're creating allows you to create a legacy piece or something that's sustainable and vibrant. Am I missing anything in if people did that, they would be successful? Um, I think, I think, I think that's the right path. And I think as we go through with future episodes and discuss all the, the various points, um, but when it comes to atmospheres, I think that's, uh, a great starting point for sure. Well, I think there's more to explore here, but uh, I'm excited about just having physically been sitting on the Mara watching sunset and watching a million acres in my, it's so hard to like take an iPhone and try and do a panoramic of <laughs> it 260 good. degree, you know, light pollution and the stars are touching the ground, which is so, optical illusion um but just sitting there and feeling the heat of the flames of your um fire pit, fi fire pit and in a in a substantive comfortable environment but also being engaged on all signs you know sides with uh sight sound smells um that was all intentionally crafted for me right so it's kind of like an architectural Disney line VIP rope, like you're guided <laughs> through this amazing experience. It's called circulation. No. Oh, circulation. Yes, that's right. Circulate. I, I forgot the term. Yeah. And, but I was circulated beautifully, <laughs> <laughs> invisibly, uh, delightfully. And so, uh, I think we need to extrapolate more from, uh, how you're intentional about doing what you're doing. And there's more subject matter coming up ahead. Um, yeah. but, 
Again, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for doing this episode with me. And thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed diving into our latest episode. If you're curious to see more of the projects we discussed, feel free to follow us on our socials. Or if you're inspired to create your own space and need our guidance, head over to malikalkadi.com to explore more. If you ever need to disconnect and experience an off-grid experience, you can visit follycollection.com to reserve your own unforgettable stay.